It's such a privilege to be here. Uh, you know, I heard at home, I'm from Denver, Colorado, it's snowing, four inches. And here I am in Hawaii, suffering for Jesus. <laughs> no, it's wonderful to be here, just to be in your church and what God is doing here is awesome. But I believe this morning will totally change your life. You know, one word from God can change you forever. Just one word. Put your hand on your heart. Say, Father, I need a word that changes me, changes my circumstances. Give me hearing ears and seeing eyes to receive what you have. Amen. Amen. Now, let me just share a little bit about Iran. I tried for four years to get into Iran, and, you know, I said, I just want to come as a tourist. They said, we know who you are. No. But you know how cool God is. The game isn't over till we win. Right? The Bible says that thanks be to God who always leads us to triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. So a Brazilian travel agency got me into Iran. Who would think God would use Brazil to get me into Iran? You don't know how cool God is. I think he has miracles with your name on it. I believe in 2014, you're going to claim some of the greatest miracles you've ever had. So put your hand on your heart. Say, God has miracles in 2014 with my name on it. Now, the cool thing about Iran is that I want to go back and do something spiritual. And, you know, they're Shiite Muslims, and so that's a pretty rough crowd. And... Uh, I want to go into a university. They have lots of universities, and I want a mullah, a leader of a mosque, to teach what the Quran says about Jesus and healing. Jesus is in the Quran. And then I want to teach what the Bible says and then pray for the sick. You know, nobody can deny a miracle. Once they get a miracle, it's too late. So I'm going back in October. And I go from here to Indonesia for four meetings. And then next October also, I go back to Pakistan. And I want you, and you, some of you saw this last year, I want you to see what went on in Pakistan the last time. Now, we had like 220,000 the last night, mostly Muslim. But this time, this year, we want a half a million. Do you believe... Jesus loves Muslims? How about Hindus? How about Buddhists? How about atheists? How about jerks? Okay, watch this. Tonight there will be many miracles in Pakistan. Because that's what's happening to you. You are hearing faith. Hallelujah. Jesus healed her. Pakistan is my favorite. Pakistan is my Pakistan is my and I believe the Pakistani people have special faith for Jesus.
Now, when we're singing hallelujah, that's when I'm inviting people to receive Jesus. So you can imagine, thousands of people stand to receive Jesus. And so you might say, well, but what about the follow-up? We have the sneakiest way to follow up, and I'm not going to tell you, but it's really good. We also always leave books in their language. Uh, I've been to Pakistan seven times. We usually do two or three books in their language. And so, you know, books are missionaries. They work while you sleep. Amen? And so when you give a Christian book to someone, you really give them something that can be very lasting and passed on. Now, this morning, I want you to have something that's free. Do you like free things? I do. <laughs> and so, you know, people say, oh, it's free. I think, yeah, that's for me. But this, these are principles of the word that I speak every day. So, you know, what do you speak every day? Oh, this is so terrible. My husband's driving me crazy. I don't have any money. You know, I'm just stupid. My kids are dumb. Don't speak those things. Speak the promise that goes with the problem. Because the word won't return void. And so the word works when you speak it. You say, well, I don't know which ones to speak. Well, you will know now. Because I have it categorized under family, under nation, under health, under wealth. You will love it. And it doesn't take that long. And it's free. Everybody say free. So be sure you get it. You have a card to sign, but be sure you get it. Now, I'm doing this morning probably the thing I like to do the most in the whole world. And that is to get people hooked on the book. You know, folks, the Bible will transform you. But the Bible just in your hand doesn't do it. It's reading the Bible and getting it inside. So I want to give you a special scripture. Psalm 51, 6 says, Thou, God, desires truth in the inward man. So what is truth? Wave your Bible at me. Say, this is truth. You can wave your phone. It's okay. <laughs> this is truth. Okay, so where is God looking for this? On your coffee table? Under your bed? On top of the refrigerator? God is looking for truth in my heart. Is that true? So when I read the word, I'm putting truth in my heart. Then he says he will take the truth and make it wisdom. So no truth here, kind of stupid up here. So when we read the Bible, we put the word inside us, and then the Holy Spirit can take that promise and bring it to your mind at a certain time. Is that true? And so it's very important we get hooked on the book and that the Bible begins to read us. Now, I'm going to give you a real simple plan. Cannot fail anyone, and it's for everyone here. Don't sit here and think, I wish my grandmother was here. You're here, and you need to get this. You can read through your Bible in a year, and it's very simple. If you read two chapters of the old and one of the new six days a week. Okay, put your hand on your heart. Say, I won't forget, two old, one new, six days a week. Then on Sundays, or one day a week, read three old and two new. Put your hand back on your heart. Say, three old and two new. You'll finish your Bible in less than a year. Now, anybody can afford that much time. What is it going to take you? Maybe 15 minutes a day. For truth to go into your heart, to be made wisdom. Maybe on Sundays, when you have three and two, it's 25 minutes a day. But folks, I am hooked on the book. I know what it will do in your life. And so I'm just encouraging you, read through the Bible this year. So I feel led for all of you to stand up. You say, is this an exercise service? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Put your hand on your heart. Say, Father, with your anointing, your help, I'm making a commitment to read through the Bible in 2014. The Word brings faith. The Word brings miracles. I believe this is my most miraculous life, most miraculous year. Now, I want you to do something. You can put your hands down, but I want you to turn around, all the way around, and look at me. All the way. 
Now say this, I believe 2014 is my turnaround year because of God's word. Amen. You can be seated. Now, what I want you to see is that Jesus is in every book of the Bible. So, you know, a lot of people, they don't read the Old Testament. They say, oh, I don't understand it. It's so hard. But when you begin to see Jesus is in every book, let me tell you, it gets very exciting. And plus that, you say, I never read the Old Testament. Let me tell you, the New Testament, two-thirds of it, is quoted from the Old. And so we need to read it all to get the 66 revelations of Jesus. Why do I need 66? Because there are 66 books. And when you behold Jesus, you go from glory to glory. So you just want this level? How about getting to 66 levels in 2014? Amen? Okay, so let me kind of share with you about Old Testament, because I'll be teaching that in this service. Old Testament has four segments. So put up your hand. Say four. Okay, so the first segment is the Pentateuch. Well, what does Pentateuch mean? It just simply means five. And Moses was inspired to write the Pentateuch. So we have Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Oh, and Jesus, when you get this study guide, Jesus in Genesis is out of this world. You will see how he is the seed of the woman. The first virgin birth promised is in Genesis 3.15. You will see so many places, and I show you that. So this isn't just a book you're going to read. It's a resource material for life. So then we see the second segment of the Old Testament has to do with history. And we see Jesus in every history book. Well, what are the history books? Joshua, Joshua's exciting book. Judges, Ruth. You know, we get into the First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, and every one of those books shows you Jesus, and that will be in there. So as you're reading through your Bible, you'll have this resource material to see who Jesus is. Then we have the poetry books. And in the next uh, service, I'm going to be teaching on the poetry books because most people love psalms. Is that true? We really like that. But did you know that psalms breaks into five segments? It breaks into segments like the Pentateuch. So if you wanted a psalm on getting free of something, you had a habit you wanted to be free of, you would turn to the Exodus psalms. If you wanted a psalm that just had to do with the importance of the word, you would turn to the Deuteronomy Psalms. So they break down into a song book, and you can sing exactly what you need. You can pick out what you need. Proverbs, Job, Job is a play. Proverbs was really written to be sung. It's a wisdom book. We like that book too. Ecclesiastes, that's another wisdom poetry book. Song of Solomon is an opera. It was to be sung. And so these poetry books are powerful to see Jesus in them. But the prophets, I have found that most Christians are prophetless. They never read the prophets. And so they say, well, I don't understand them. How do you know if you don't read it? And Isaiah, Isaiah 53 gives the best picture of Jesus of all. That's a prophet. And we have major prophets. And you say, well, what does it mean if they're a major prophet? It just means they wrote a longer book. So when we look at Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, they're major prophets. But then the minor prophets, oh, some of the sweetest things of Jesus are in the minor prophets. In the next service, I'll be teaching on Hosea. It's one of the greatest revelations of Jesus in the whole Bible. It makes you weep when you get into it. But in this service, I'm teaching on history. So I want to go to the history books. Now, remember, we have four sections. Everybody say four. So what do we have? Let's see if you're listening. We have the Pentateuch. Everybody say Pentateuch. We have history. We have poetry. And we have prophets. You're so smart. You must have gotten up early and had your coffee. So 
we see the four segments of the Old Testament. Now, actually, the New Testament, and I'll be teaching that at 6 and 7.30, it's four segments, too. We have the Gospels, we have Acts as the history, we have the Epistles, and we have Revelation. And I have memorized the book of Revelation. So you say, well, everybody teach it differently. Who's right? I am. <laughs> so that will be at 6 and 7.30. But this morning, this service, I want to really get hold of history, of Jesus in history. So I'm going to go to a special book of Ruth. And if you have your Bible on your phone or wherever, turn to the book of Ruth. And so, you know, it's r real early in the Bible, you know, Joshua, Judges, Ruth. And you will see in this book probably one of the greatest pictures of Jesus of any place. And so we see a very sad story because we see a woman and her husband, Naomi and Elimelech, and they leave Bethlehem. Now, Bethlehem means house of bread, but there's a famine going on. And I want to just say this, being a pastor's wife for so many years, I think a lot of times we say, well, you know, I'm just not fed like I want to be at church, and I, I'm just going to skip church. You know, when you make those kind of decisions, you get out in the world, and I'm telling you, the world will bash you to pieces. And so they should never have left Bethlehem. So it wasn't everything they wanted it to be. And they go to Moab, and Moab worships an idol called Chemosh, which means a dunghill deity. Say yuck three times. Yuck, yuck, yuck. So imagine leaving the house of bread to go to a place where they worship a dunghill deity. And then on top of it, her sons, the two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, marry Moabitess girls. They're idolatresses. And then her husband dies, and her sons die. So she hears that there's a harvest going on in Bethlehem, that, you know, the famine is over, it's really good. So she makes a decision to go back. So she says to her daughters-in-law, she said, you know, I'm going to go back to Bethlehem, and I don't have any more sons for you to marry, your widows, and you should stay here. You're familiar with the customs. You worship the idols. You know, the food is familiar to you, and I'm leaving you. Now, one of them, and actually there are three E's in this book. You can do what is expected. You can do the exceptional, and when you do the exceptional, that's a faith thing. You get the extraordinary. So we can live like the world, and so, you know, Orpah says, well, I think I'll stay. Well, that's what you would expect her to do. We never hear of her again. But Ruth said, no, Naomi, I want to go with you. I want to live where you live. I want to die where you die. And I want your God to be my God. Now that is exceptional, that she would leave everybody, Leave her family, leave her idols, and follow Naomi, who is really a whiny mother-in-law. You know, who wants to live with a whiny mother-in-law? And so she follows her. That's exceptional. Any time you make a faith decision, you're getting ready for the extraordinary. When you make a faith decision based on the word of God, watch what God will do. So she goes with Naomi, and they get to Bethlehem, and Naomi kind of whines around, and of course, they're really poor, and Ruth has to go out and ask for food, kind of they'd go and glean the corners the poor people would, and so Naomi tells her, now you need to go to a relative's field, and she said, Boaz is a very rich man, very spiritual man, go to his field because we're relatives, so Ruth says to Naomi, and they pray that she will have favor. So I think that's unique. So she goes out in the field, she's gleaning, and Boaz notices her and invites her to lunch. And she says, why should I have favor with you? That is so female. You know, you just prayed for it. Well, I don't know why this is so good, but you prayed it'd be good. So he likes her. She has favor. And the lunch is so delicious, and she does something in the book of Ruth that's so sweet. She takes some of the lunch, and she puts it in her pocket, Pastor, 
and takes it home to Naomi. Now see, she could have thought, that old lady, I'm bringing grain home for her. I'm sure not going to share lunch with her. You know, uh, I'm not going to give her any fried chicken. But she's so warm and loving, and she's taken the God of Naomi. That's exceptional. So now watch the extraordinary. Folks, I have an extraordinary life, but it's not an accident. It's doing what the Word says. It's feeding on the Word, reading the Word. That is so key. And so she brings the, it home, and then in chapter 3 of Ruth, Naomi kind of comes alive, and she gives her some advice of how to get a mate. How many of you are single? How many of you would like to have a mate? Well, I'm going to pray for you in a minute. And, but she gives some very good advice to women. She said, Ruth, and this is in, in Ruth 3, she said, take a bath. You know, smelling good is good. She said, buy a new dress. I mean, don't just look like some slop bucket. You know, men have eyes, right? And so she said, buy a new dress and anoint yourself. Get some Estee Lauder. <laughs> now, you may laugh at this, but Ruth got the man. <laughs> and so Naomi now, getting back in the house of bread, you know, she's getting into more exceptional into faith. So she says to Ruth, you know, Boaz is a kinsman to your dead husband. Now watch what we're going to see Jesus in this. So she said, you know, a kinsman can marry, marry the widow of a dead kinsman, but the first son they have will have the name of the dead kinsman. Now, how many men are looking for a woman that the first child they have won't have his name? I mean, that's unusual. And then on top of that, they have to prove they're a relative, and they have to buy, put up the money for the land that the dead husband is supposed to have. So I'm sure there were just men knocking her door down. There weren't. So Naomi begins to move in the spirit. And she said, you know, we're really at harvest time. And tonight, you know, he will be tired from the harvest time. Lie down at his feet and pull his robe over on you. Now you say, well, this looks very immoral. No, she's asking for him to be her covering. So she goes that night, lies down at his feet. He's asleep, and she pulls his robe over on her. And when he wakes up, there is Ruth. Now Ruth is doing something in faith, exceptional. What do exceptional people get? You forgot what do exceptional people get? Extraordinary! So, he, she says to him, you know, I, I would like for you to marry me, you know, because you're related, you're in the family. Would you be my covering? And he does the exceptional. He said, yes, I want to marry you. But there's one relative closer, and I have to check it out. Now that means he has to buy her a dead husband's land. That means the first child, son, won't have his name. It will have the name of the dead husband. That's exceptional. So let's watch, boys. When you do exceptional things, you get extraordinary things. And one of the exceptional things I see here is that they didn't have sex. And in this day, that's exceptional. And if you'll keep your life right with God, you'll get the extraordinary. And I want to say that to men and women. Sleep around, honey, and you'll get something you may not want. Are you mad at me? Put your hand on your heart. Say, I can't be mad at you. You're too sweet. <laughs> they don't sleep together. She goes home. She tells Naomi. And Boaz goes to the relative and said, now, you know, Ruth is here, and her husband's land is here. Uh, would you want to marry her? Because there's quite a bit of land here. Now, he did the expected. 
No, he said, I don't think so. I got a wife and I've got kids and I don't know I want to put up that money and I certainly don't want a child, that won't, a son that won't bear my name. No, and that's people do the expected, but then they never get the extraordinary. Amen? And so Boaz then steps up and marries her. Now watch Naomi. Because this first child, they have a boy, Obed. This first child, Naomi, is a grandmother. Well, it's impossible for her to be a grandmother. Her sons are dead. But this baby bears the name of her dead son. Don't tell God what he can't do. And so here Naomi, going back, she made an exceptional decision, got an extraordinary thing from God, got a grandson. And so she, they give him to her. She takes care of him. But it's very interesting that the grandson's name is Obed. They name the grandson Obed. And Obed has a son named Jesse. And Jesse has a son named David. You say, what? Ruth got in the genealogy of King David? Absolutely. Now, New Testament, Matthew 1.5 it lists five women in the genealogy of Jesus, but it also lists boys. Now, you think, well, boys shouldn't be there because that son doesn't bear his name. He bears the name of the dead husband. But God said, I'll throw that out the window. Boaz did the exceptional thing. I'm going to put him in the genealogy of Jesus. Folks, if you want to be and see God's extraordinary, don't do what is expected like the world. Do the exceptional even when you're not popular. And watch God do the extraordinary. And so when we look at Matthew, we say, oh my goodness, Ruth, Ruth, Boaz, God in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. That's extraordinary. Amen? Now I'm going to just share some little personal things because I think that God wants you to have an extraordinary year. But unless you do the faith thing, you're not going to have the supernatural extraordinary. Oh, I want extraordinary. Then do the exceptional. What's the exceptional? Faith. Everybody say faith. Now, how are you going to have faith if you don't read the Bible? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And this, you will see Jesus in every book of the Bible. You, you'll see much more in depth with Ruth than what I've had time to teach you this morning. So I'm going to tell you, growing up, I loved foreign languages. I wanted to be a foreign language teacher. Then I decided I wanted to be an ambassador. So, you know, I'm taking Spanish and French and Latin, and I'm getting ready to go to higher university. I was a school teacher. And uh, I met my husband, who's just radical for Jesus, spirit-filled, went to church seven nights a week and drugged me with him. And so we got engaged after eight or nine months. Now, I'm, not, I'm born again, but I'm not real turned on. And so one night, he was coming to our house for dinner, and uh, he called, and he loved my mother's cooking, and he said... Uh, I'm not coming for dinner, I'll come later. So I said, why didn't you come for dinner? He said, I'm fasting. I said, fasting, who are you fasting for? He said, you. Oh, I was so mad at him. I said, I'm a Christian. He said, yes, but you're not a committed one. And he said, I serve the devil with all my heart and I'm not gonna marry a woman who's half-hearted because I'm gonna serve God with all my heart. I was so mad I could have slapped him. I said, you want your ring? No, he said, I want you to get spirit filled. So for three nights, I'm a junior high teacher, I can't sleep. And the third night, and God really dealt with me about surrendering to him totally. The third night, the Lord said to me, if you don't make your surrender now and be filled with the Spirit, he said, I'm going to show you what you're going to do. You're going to move to California. You're going to get your master's. He said, you know, and you'll never marry Wallace Hickey. But he said, if you surrender to me now, I have something so wonderful for you, you cannot imagine. And so I said, Lord, if I never marry Wallace Hickey, 
I surrender to you. I got filled with the Spirit, and here I am. I've been in 125 countries. Hallelujah. And Muslims think I'm the best thing since sliced bread. That is extraordinary. That's a supernatural life. Are you hearing what I'm saying? But it's a surrender. It's being in the Word. It's making decisions that are not the expected ones, but the exceptional ones. Little did I dream when God said, I have something so wonderful for you, how wonderful it would really be that I'd even get to be in Hawaii in January. And so I share that with you. It is so key that we put our lives in the place of doing the exceptional so God can do the extraordinary. Amen? Amen. Now, we get into these things through a process and so when you look at the history books, and you can look at people, and that's why I like the history books, because it tells people stories. And it tells about people who do stupid things. And it tells about people who do right things. And it tells about people who repent and turn around. It shows you the results of good decisions. So I will tell you one more. How's our time, Pastor? Are we okay? Okay. How much time? We're all right. Okay, I want to talk to you about Joshua. Ah, oh, Joshua. I mean, even his name is Jesus. It's another Joshua. It's another name. And oh, you see Jesus in this book all over the place. But Moses spoke to Joshua and said, you are to be the leader now and take him into the promised land. And so God spoke to Joshua how he could be successful, how he could come in on the extraordinary he said, if you will do the exceptional, and he gave him three things. Everybody say three. Look at someone and say, honey, be sure you listen. Three. He said, if you will meditate on the word of God day and night, if you will speak the word day and night, if you will do the word day and night, you will make your own way prosperous and successful. Now you say, well, he had to read the word, he had to speak the word, he had to obey the word. So what book did he take? Did he take Proverbs? No, <laughs> hasn't been written. He only had the Pentateuch. Can you imagine taking Leviticus day and night? And so he meditated on the word. Actually, he memorized it. And he got the promised land in six and a half years. And the miracles that came in his life, one time when they were in a big battle, he told the sun to stand still. Folks, that's exceptional. Is that true? Sun, stand still. Moon, stay in the Valley of Agilon. And it did it. And it said there was never a day since like that. And they won. He got in a battle with some of the people taking the promised land. And God sent hail. And this was very discriminating hail. It hit the bad guys and missed the good guys. So you're fighting with someone and bong, the hail hit him. That's extraordinary. How many of you want an extraordinary life? And that comes through faith. And faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So I believe God is talking to you. That this year is to be your most extraordinary year. But it takes the word to make it extraordinary. How many of you here are single and you'd like to marry? Not someone else's husband. That's not a dream, that's a nightmare. Would you mind standing up? I'd like to just pray for you. I have great faith for wives and husbands because my own daughter got the best. You wanna just raise your hand? Okay. Father, I just thank you that this is a year of good weddings wise choices. I thank you. This is a year of extraordinary marriages because your hand is upon them like Ruth and Boaz and that you're giving everyone in this service a hunger for the word of God. Amen? amen. Everybody say amen. amen. All right. Now, let me just share one other thing I have back there at the book and tape table. I don't know how you are, but I like to give books as gifts because you can really do some things when you give people books. You leave it, 
They read it, God begins to do things. So I have one called Know Your Ministry, and it's taken from Romans 12. And it tells you about seven motive gifts. And one of them, the first one is prophecy. And this person likes to identify evil. And he's very black and white. Uh, My daughter absolutely has this motive gift. She's very black and white. You know, sometimes I say, Sarah, could you be a little gray? Just a little. Because she really wants to identify everything as good or bad. And this second one, and that's kind of the eye of the body, and that would be John the Baptist. But the second one is the server. Put your hand up. And this person loves to meet the needs of the body. Martha was a server. Ruth was a server. And so we see the server that's involved. But the third one is an ear. And this is the teacher. This person loves the word. They want to be sure everything is Bible. If they leave a service, well, they didn't give us enough scripture, or they didn't use scripture. So they're very concerned as word center. But the next one is like a three-leaf clover, like a tree. And this is the exhorter. This is the most popular person in the body. This is Barnabas a lot. They love people. They want to be sure everything taught, people can get it, that it's applicable. And they like to counsel people. Then we have the next one, which is the dollar sign one. And this is the person who prospers financially and loves to see the financial needs of the body met. And so perhaps that's you. You have an ability to prosper, but God has a purpose for prosperity. Like paying off your new building. That would be very wonderful. Could you believe for that? Could you? Put up both your hands. Say, Father, give us big financial miracles for the new building. Debt-free. Decorated. Debt-free. This building has favor. People want to run into it. Get saved. Spirit-filled. Healed. Delivered. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 What about the organizer? Oh, this person, and I always do a profile with this. This person likes to set goals and develop people to reach goals. Nehemiah is beautiful. He goes out at night, sees which gates are down, where there's a hole in the wall. Then he gets the people together and they volunteer on wherever they live, the nearest to, to fix it. And he gets the walls up in 52 days, a miracle. And so this person likes to organize things. But the last one is the heart of the body, and this is mercy. They're very compassionate. This was my husband. If he preached, it was always merciful. If he prophesied, it was merciful. If he counseled you, it was merciful. I remember one time I was going out to counsel someone. He said, remember, be merciful. I said, I don't want to be. They don't need mercy. I need to blast them. No. (laughs) Now, one of these is yours. Probably two or three you've developed in them. So where's my bottle of water? If I took this bottle this morning and I poured some out and you responded, you would say, you need to repent. We don't like speakers pouring water on our floor. That's prophecy. If you're a server, you'd say, not to worry, I'll clean it up. If you're a teacher, you'll say, what scripture do you have for pouring water on the floor? If you're an exhorter, you will say, what spiritual lesson is God trying to teach you? If you were a person that God has given ability to make money and to give, you would say, not to worry, I'll buy enough bottles of water for every speaker. If you were an organizer, you would say, how many volunteers will bring water next week? But if you're mercy, you would come up and say to me, oh, Marilyn, don't be embarrassed about spilling water. The last speaker we had spilled water too. So one of these, or maybe two or three, identify you. And that's in Know Your Gift. And I think you would just love it. It's a small book, but most of all, You know, be sure you get the seeing Jesus in every book of the Bible. It will transform you.
Now, you might say this morning, how did you get into all this? You know, here you were a school teacher, and, you know, my husband wasn't in the ministry when I married him. And I even asked him, do you think you'll ever go in the ministry? He said, no. I said, that's good. I'm not marrying a minister. How? Let me tell you, it started when I was 16. When I was 16, I went to a Methodist youth camp. And a Baptist minister spoke, and I knew about Jesus. I went to Sunday school, but I didn't know you could have him inside. He will come into your heart and live in you. It's not Christ outside the hope of glory. It's Christ inside. So they told us, you can repent of your sins, believe that Jesus died for your sins, invite him into your heart, you know, and he will come in. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. I prayed that one prayer. I'm 82 and a half. The prayer is still working. He never left me, never has forsaken me. You know, and I've done stupid things, and he loves stupid people. It's obvious. Are you hearing me? Do you think I'm sorry I prayed and invited Jesus into my heart? That's the best decision. That's the supernatural decision, and I have eternal life. So I'm just going to have everyone pray this morning. It won't hurt you. You say, I already have. Well, do it again. Recommit your life for 2014. And if you never have, or you're a backslider, you're coming back, let this prayer on January the 5th transform your life. So everyone pray with me. Say, Father, I know you love me. You have a wonderful destiny for my life. I thank you this morning that Jesus died for my sins and arose from the dead. I repent of all my sins, and I thank you, Jesus, they're under the blood. Now, Jesus, come into my heart. You take over. You make my life extraordinary. And I thank you you will never leave me nor forsake me. Amen. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Amen. Now, we all repented. So where is our sin? It's under the blood. Is that true? Because he forgives you of past sins, present, and future. So put your hands up. Say bye-bye. Past sins. I am free. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus sets me free from the law of sin and death. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah.